this is my read through and analysis of section five of part two. I do not expect it, Priam says quietly. I believe it is possible. I believe, and he is astonished at the enormity of the thought he is expressing. He whose whole life has been guided by what is established and conventional. Surely, he thinks, it is a goddess who is speaking through me. I believe, he says, that the thing that is needed to cut this knot we are all tied in is something that has never before been thought, done or thought of. Something impossible, something new. Okay, so here we start off with Priam um, explaining or basically talking about the the change that he wants to enforce. So he starts off kind of talking about how um, like he's astonished at his own thought. Um, his whole life has been guided by what's established, what's conventional, so traditional, what's been done a billion times um, before him. And what's expected of him. And then it's interesting, I think, that he says it's a goddess who is speaking through me. And I think that really says something about um, th this. Throughout the book, gods are referred to pretty consistently. I think it's interesting that a goddess is the thing the thing that Priam thinks is responsible for this thought. Um, it kind of, to me, says that um, Maloof is sort of positing that um, female energy and feminine things are kind of agents of change and that they're more accepting of change. Um, and then this little section here that I've labelled as change. So um, what he's saying here, the thing that's needed to cut this knot we're tied in is something that hasn't been thought of or done before. So the only thing that can help us escape this kind of rut that we're stuck in is change something impossible something new something different okay she composes herself hoods her eyes and sits the assurance with which he has spoken the quietness that has spread around them makes her wary she must not cross him but the danger of what he is determined on fills her with alarm she will need all her wiles all her powers of firm but calm persuasion to lead him back from it but she would never get there she whispers okay so this is actually showing us um, Hecuba as a protector. She's, she's recognising that this is dangerous um, and she knows that she, does, she can't cross him because he has the power in this situation. But she recognises that this is dangerous and she's saying she needs to basically have her wits about her so that she can persuade him not to do this thing. So this is kind of um, positing women as protectors as well. So... Um, she doesn't have anywhere near the amount of power that Priam has or that the princes have um, in a more traditional sense, but she still has power. She still is able to uh, recognise that it's her role to protect Priam from what he wants to do. Um, she's also talking about how she must adhere to the traditional role expectations. So she can't just say, Priam, you can't do that because... She's his wife. She needs to respect him. So first, there's two things going on here. First of all, she's his wife. Second thing is um, he's the king. So he can't just be told what he can and can't do. She knows she needs to approach this really delicately. <clears throat> Some swaggering lout among the Greeks would strike you down before you got even halfway to the camp. Think of it. Two old men in a cart laden with gold. Do you suppose your grey hairs would save you? No, he admits, but the gods might, if it was their intention that I get there. Priam, Priam, she sighs, and again takes his hand. This is folly. It is, yes, I know, but what seems foolish is just what is most sensible sometimes. The fact that it has never been done, that it is novel, unthinkable, except that I have thought of it, is just what makes me believe it should be attempted. It is possible because it is not possible, and because it is simple. Why do we think always that the simple thing is beneath us? Because we are kings? What I do is what any man might do. But you are not any man. All right. So uh, Hecuba is obviously explaining that this is a highly dangerous situation. She's kind of talking about what could go wrong here. Um, it's interesting that Priam, um, even though he's talking about, he's talking about change, he's talking about him being the agent of change, he's still referring to the gods and their intentions. So he's talking about fate versus chance here. So he still believes that the gods are in control and they that they are allowing him to have these thoughts. 
<clears throat> okay. Um, and then here he's saying um, it's possible because it's not possible. So he's, he's talking about why – basically he's saying to Hecuba, why do you think I can't do this? Like this is a simple thing and I should be able to do this. I am a man like any other man is. Um, you know, do, do we think that this simple thing is beneath us because of our role? So he's talking about his humanity versus his role. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting as well that Hecuba responds with, but you are not any man. The, you know, yes, any man can do that, but that is not you. That's not the role that you have in this society. That's true. In one way, I'm not. But in another deeper way, I am. I feel a kind of freedom in that. It's a feeling I like. It appeals to me. And perhaps because it is unexpected, it may appeal to him too. The chance to break free of the obligation of being always the hero, as I am expected to always expected always to be the king. To take on the lighter bond of being simply a man. Perhaps that is the real gift I have to bring uh, have to bring him. Perhaps that is the ransom. Okay, yay, we have the word ransom, title of the novel. <coughs> Alright. So um, here he's saying he feels a freedom in the idea that he is just a man and that he can offer Achilles the opportunity to also be just a man. So these are two characters who have their, their identities are very much tied to the roles that they perform for their societies, respectively. And Prima is saying a chance to escape that and to just be might be the thing that I can offer him and that's the thing that I can ransom for Hector's body. Hecuba shakes her head. And if you are too lost, who will st- and if you too are lost, who will stand by me in what we know is to come? Because we know, both of us, what that is, and can speak of it here where there is no one else to hear it, just ourselves and the gods. Her voice has fallen to the merest breath. The flame of the lamp, too, gutters and fails. Who will share this weight of sorrow that is coming to us? And when my spirit fails, who will lend me the hand of comfort as you do now, my dear one? Who will keep Troy, our beloved city, alive with at least a semblance of the old neighbourliness and order of its great centre and source, if its great centre and source is gone? They sit in silence now, her hand in his. They have spoken of these things before, quietly, soberly. They are two old people consulting together, seeking comfort in one another's presence. Two children holding hands in the dark. Okay, so... Here we have a description through Hecuba's eyes of Priam's role as a protector of Troy. Um, and So what they're talking about here, what Hecuba's talking about is we know that there are still worse things to come in Troy because of the war. Um, this isn't the end. So if you're lost, who is going to guide this city through that loss, through that devastation? Who's going to be there for me? Who's going to be there um, to... So who's going to be there to keep Troy alive with the old neighbourliness and order if the great centre and source is gone? So the great centre and source being Priam. So she's saying your duty is to Troy. It's to be here so that you can pull Troy through um, what's inevitably going to happen. Um, I really like this description we've got here of, of uh, Priam and Hecuba. So... Two old people consulting together seeking comfort and we've got two children holding hands in the dark. So this description is not of them as kings, as king and queen, as protectors of Troy, um, as symbolic roles. This is a description of them as they are to each other. Um, this is a description of them just being human, being together, working through this problem that they have together. Am I being selfish? She asks at length. But the question is to herself, and she has no answer. His voice, too, when he replies, is no more than a breath. If I do not succeed in this and am lost, then all is lost. We must leave that to the gods or to chance. There, and a little shiver goes through him. He has said it. Chance? She looks up quickly. Surely she has misheard. It seems to me, he says, almost dreamily, that there might be another way of naming what we call fortune and attribute to the will or the whim of the gods, which offers a kind of opening, the opportunity to act for ourselves, to try something that might, might force events into a different course. Okay, so this is the first time he brings up the word chance, the idea of chance with Hecuba. Um, she looks up quickly. Surely she's misheard. She's clearly not loving this idea of chance. Um, 
but he kind of he sort of just slips it in he's saying well if this um if i don't succeed then all is lost but we have to leave that up to what the gods think unless we just leave it up to chance which he's saying creates an opportunity um to act for ourselves saying that the idea of chance and just essentially what he's talking about is just giving things a go and seeing what happens um that is the thing that can enforce change so it might force events into a different course she wishes she had misheard words are powerful they too can be the agents of what is new of what is conceivable and can be thought and let loose upon the world that Priam of all men should say such things. He who has always been so observant of what is established and lawful makes her wonder now if his wits are not unstrung. She needs time. She needs the help of her sons. Okay, so this is Hecuba's um, perception of chance and what Priam is talking about. Basically, she's she is so taken aback by this idea that not everything is ordained by the gods that she kind of is saying, has Priam lost the plot? Um, she's it's I like what she's saying about words being powerful they are the agents of what's new um, and she's saying that like for Priam to be saying this he's so observant of what's established and lawful he's so observant of traditions he's so embedded in tradition um, that that's what's the fact that he's completely he's like he's doing a 180 on what his role is and what he has been to Hecuba up until this point um and that is what makes her think you know maybe he's not okay this is so left of field this is so bizarre for him that there clearly must be something else going on here 